This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Hey everybody, it's John Hall, the senior editor of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. And sitting across from me on the table today is Jonathan Wakefield, the namesake of Jay Wakefield Brewing down in Miami, Florida. Uh, John, how you doing? Doing okay. What are you screwing around with these days? Oh boy, uh, a lot of things. Uh, mostly fruit and stouts and uh, anything sour, hazy IPAs, across the board, you know, we try to cover it all. But I mean, you know, you're known for using crazy ingredients or trying things at different times and, and dropping things in that are sort of unexpected. So, I mean, what, what's sort of moving you these days? Like where oh. you've been riding the trend of fruited Berliners for, for, for a long time. I mean, you're responsible for, for bringing these fruited Berliners into our lives, um, uh, in, in, in many ways. And it's gotta be tough though, right? To, to continue to keep trying to stay on top of that. And so I, I wonder like where, well, absolutely. I mean, it's always tough to stay on the cutting edge. I would say it's tough to stay on the cutting edge, um, but we are constantly trying to roll out new flavors. Like we just dropped a new can last week uh, where we incorporated a new fruit into the old namesake, you know, uh, three, which would be mango, guava, passion fruit. We threw strawberry in it, mm-hmm. did that. You know, we also have done the orange, banana, strawberry, Berliner. Um, we actually did a huckleberry one where we actually brought in fresh huckleberries from the Pacific Northwest, uh, which is new for us. I mean, we rolled, we rolled out a bunch of new ones this year already. Where are you looking though for, for, for fruit? Are you scouring farmer's markets? Are you reading fruit trade magazines? Are you, do you know, just- <laughs> I, I used to, I used to actually surf the, the web for the, those, uh, the websites that would be connected to the farmers that would have the fresh local produce Mm -hmm. wherever you could get it across the country, whatever it may be. I mean, for us in Miami, it's, it's a great scene because we get almost all the exotic fruits. Mm -hmm. Obviously we don't get apples. Oranges don't grow down there. Um, but dragon fruit, mango, guava, passion fruit, lychees, uh, star fruit, kumquat. I mean, it's bountiful, um, down there as far as exotic fruits go, but we also look elsewhere. Like, Typically next month, I'll get uh, hidden rose apples from Oregon, which mm-hmm. only are cultivated or gr- picked and uh, processed one time a year within like a three week time span in in Oregon, and we get those brought in fresh, just like we had fresh huckleberries brought in during huckleberry season mm-hmm. from from Washington State. So we kind of look all over the place. I want to get back to to some of the ingredients in a minute, but. I think one of the, the, the most important things and, and that a lot of folks aren't necessarily thinking about is if you're going to have a successful Florida Vice fruited Berliner, whatever we're calling it these days, you actually have to have a really great base recipe. Like everything starts yes. with, with, with the foundation. Yes. Um, and I, I don't know if we always see that from some of the folks who are doing quick kettle sours and, uh, you know, trying some of this. They're, they're thinking more about the uh, ancillary fruit. ingredients and, and the fruit than they are the actual base. And, and you didn't approach it that way in the beginning. No, I mean, I kind of approached it, I don't know, from a culinary standpoint. Okay. Having kind of like a great base product, and then you can build on top of that. You know, because without a great base product, no matter what you add to it, it, it doesn't matter. So what goes into making a great For us, base? I mean, yeah. for us, it's really our house lacto strain. It is different from everyone else's. I mean, I would bank money on that. Okay. I mean, just the the acid profile, the flavor characteristics, everything about it is different than everybody else's Berliner. Yeah. Yeah. And then, do you think that's one of the reasons that you've been able to stand as tall as long as you have? Well, that and I think consistency. I think the base is consistent. And then no matter what we add to it, I mean, it's always going to add more layers, you know, more complexity by whatever you may add to it. I think it's going to 
overall improve that base. I mean, it's already good by itself. I mean, that's why we do serve the base in the tap room by itself. Mm -hmm. We sell it to distro as well, but it's a great base. And so whatever we add into the mix, I think it just takes it that much further. Are there things that don't work as far as additions go? Uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, we've done a lot of different things. I mean, banana is a tough one to carry over. Um, we haven't spicy ones are. Eh. I mean, I mean, I think the the market for spicy beers is very small, anyways. Mm-hmm. But as far as like crowd pleasing large numbers, yeah, spicy beers. As far as putting spice into a Berliner base, acid and spice don't really seem to mix. Are there ones that you were excited about in the past that just didn't hit commercially or didn't hit with the fans that you were disappointed in or surprised in or uh, uh, you know, that you wish you could grab people by the lapels and be like, yeah, but, but try it again. Right. I mean, I think we've, we've done that. I mean, can I name them specifically? Probably not because we've done so many of them at this yeah. point. Um, but there are, there are always, you know, those, that fall short of what you expect them to do, mm-hmm. hoping to be greater than that. Um, but, you know, that's why we keep pushing. But obviously we do go back and remake the ones that are home runs. When it comes to fruit, are you finding that fresh yeah. is best, is puree the way to go? You guys aren't really using extracts or, you know, syrups we, or anything. No, my number one rule when I opened the brewery was we would never use extracts. I never used them in home brewing. Mm-hmm. I would never use them commercially. Uh, I mean, something out of a dropper bottle that you have one drop for 30 gallons is not, I mean, that's not real to me. Right. Uh, we have used pu- purees. I mean, I tend to go away from that. We, we do use them, but... The thought of using aseptic puree is something that's already been par cooked, so you're actually cooking out some of the flavor of that product. Mm-hmm. So I don't think the flavor is the same as it would be if you were doing it fresh. There's so many people who are going that route, though. Did, and, and again, I, you know, I, I think people do credit you, um, you know, and, and others of your generation with, with sort of bringing this forward. Does it does it make you cringe a little bit, like when people are using? I, I don't want to say cheating because they're just doing it their the extracts. Own way. Yeah, you can taste it. To me, it tastes cloying and overly like that product. Instead of having that nuance or that flavor of the product, and then that subtle hits here or there of that. I mean, you're talking about full on pronunciation of that in your face. Yeah, I mean, to me, I can immediately taste when people use extract in their beers. I mean, it's. I mean. I mean, to each their own. I mean, people might like that a lot. But for me, no. It's just never going to happen. No. No. One of the things that I've always been sort of struck by with you is, you know, your homebrewing background and that you sort of, you know, made your own luck in this way. You know, like you, you, know, you, you discovered it, you figured out what you wanted to do. Um, and I, I don't know too many other homebrewers who had the same reception that you did uh, in those early days. You know, I mean, there's people who have been homebrewers who have gone pro, but we hear about them afterwards. I mean, right. you were as a homebrewer, you know, almost in the, the first name club of, of, of craft beer, which, which is incredible. Right. Um, do you still miss homebrewing or is the, the, the stuff that you're doing these days, like keeping you grounded into that world? I mean, for me, it's, I mean, there's a big difference. I miss the experimentation because now for me to experiment is 465 gallons instead of 15. Yeah. So, I mean, what it really means is me getting off my rear and buying a pilot system, you know, I mean, and, and bringing that experimentation back into the brewery itself. But we, I mean, we still experiment a lot. Yeah. I mean, we take a lot of gambles, throw the dice, and we've been lucky enough that majority of them have stuck and done well. Um, but we constantly have been doing new things. Like um, we started the Batito series, which we moved from glass growlers to canned crowlers. Okay. So allowing us the ability, so we'll go to the supermarket and find whatever's in season and fruit, bring that back, process that in-house, and actually blend that with the base and sell it in crawlers to go. I mean, as fresh as you can possibly get. It hasn't yeah. sat through fermentation, hasn't done anything like that. Um, and it's just like those experiments to see what else, like what other combos can we do if it works here well, then it may work on a larger scale. So it's constantly kind of trying to push those buttons to stay out front 
and see what else we can do is always is always interesting for us. The, you just brought up something that um, um, I was kind of curious about of the processing at the brewery. And so I know when most people, when they're using fruit, it's sort of a, a special occasion or, you know, it's not all the time as it were, or they're using extracts so they don't have to worry about it. But in using fresh fruit as often as you guys do, what sort of equipment do you have? Do you just, oh, do we you- have, uh, we basically would have like a, uh, a kitchen's, uh, use of like, like a full service kitchen, like a, for, you know, fine dining, like we have you know, food processors, we have juicers, we have the full stand, like boat motor, like propelled mixers itself that we process everything by hand. We have full layout on tables. It takes a few people depending on what it is that we're processing, but it's all done by hand, sanitized, you know, processed, and then added to the beer. I mean, it's labor intensive for sure. Um, But I think the end product shows that. What is one fruit that, uh, or you know one ingredient that you've that has just been so ridiculous to, to have to process and to, oh. to work that you just never want to do it again. Um, I could probably name a few. All right, we got time. Um, for us, it would be we did an experiment with a beer with soursop. I don't. I'm not so, familiar with that. So yeah. it's a it's a South American Central American fruit. Um, looks like a giant green egg with the uh, scales on it and it has white flesh and 30 to 40 i don't know dime sized seeds or, okay. or larger and growing on the outside or inside no they're on the inside okay. with the flesh but to get them away from the flesh it's it's a nightmare so we actually had to push them through a fine like sieve food like a food mill almost to get them to separate and it's like okay we're never doing this again <laughs> And then we did a beer uh, a couple years back with uh, against the grain with plums and uh, apricots, and they were not overly ripe. So to actually remove the stones from the fruit themselves was, I mean, it was it was like four hundred pounds of each, and you're talking about you yeah. know like yeah. dollar Half dollar, dollar coin yeah. you know fruit, and it's like okay, it's, we had to take breaks because. These things are so small, and I have big hands, and it's like, doesn't work. I mean, I mean on days like that, it, it, like tempers have to flare a little bit, right? There has to be like a little bit of like a, uh, a general frustration that sort of permeates the brewery for something that should be fun. Oh, exactly. I mean, because it gets daunting after a while, you know. But I think it, you just try to remind everybody we're doing this for the greater cause of like better quality ingredients equal better quality beer. Yeah. I mean for the most part. But yes, I mean, that's the idea behind it. I mean, um, but there are a lot of fruits that we deal with that are super easy to process as well. So let's move to stouts because you know, it's what you first brought up at this point. Um, where do you see stouts in America right Mm -hmm. now? And Mm -hmm. where would you like to see it go? I mean, I've been drinking stouts and craft beer for 13 years. So I know what they were back then when you would have just, you know, an imperial stout, mm-hmm. and that was it. And then you would have it barrel aged, and that was it. And that was the trend for five years. Yeah, a good amount of time. You know what I mean? Where there was nothing added to the stouts. And then maybe you'd see one that had some vanilla in it, and that would be about it. You'd get a vanilla barrel aged stout, and there would be nothing else. And then, you know, I remember drinking Maui's coconut porter. Yeah. And then, that's a great beer. And that was the first one I saw that really had coconut in it. So like the actual is, coconut. Yeah. Right. You know, and then it's come so far from that. I mean, we're at a point where anything goes almost. I mean, I still try to relate our stouts to desserts. You know, what desserts are great that we think would work in a stout base, and that's kind of where we go with it. So what's a good example of that? Um, tiramisu. Okay. Or... German chocolate cake, or we've done interpretation of a Southern coconut cake, um, Neapolitan. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's endless loads. I mean, people, I've seen people do flan, um, it just, you run the gamut. I mean, I mean, we do a lot of things. I mean, a lot with coconut, vanilla, also hazelnuts. You also have the coffee, you know, vanilla, cacao nibs. I mean, 
marshmallows. I mean, it's just whatever you think you can get your hands on, you know, sweets wise to put into that beer. And do you have the same approach with those stouts that you do with the no extracts? Okay. No, no. I use whole vanilla beans that we process before every batch. I mean, we are using real coconut. We are using, you know, toasted cacao nibs, hazelnuts, you know, the best coffee we can source. Yeah. Um, all that stuff is also real. There is no extracts for us. It's got to be expensive, though. Oh, of course. Of course. And it does carry over to the final cost of the product, but n- we don't lay it all out there. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of people get the misconception that twenty twenty five dollar bottle of beer, you know, is like way too expensive. I think if people actually knew what the cost of vanilla beans were per pound, I mean, it's insane. Well, I think we're over four hundred twenty dollars a pound now. Yeah, and that doesn't go very far. No, I mean, especially when you got guys using a pound of vanilla bean per barrel. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's right. Yeah. So, so it's a good yeah, amount of money. Exactly. But you can't put that on to the consumer no, as well. No, That's why it doesn't really always carry over that way. I mean, so the margins aren't as great as people might think they are. Yeah. Especially on stouts. But why keep doing it then? I mean, I love making stouts. I enjoy drinking stouts. And people, I mean, it, right now, people love drinking imperial stouts. I mean, the way we've seen in Florida. I mean, it's either something below 6.5% or they want something... 12% or higher. We've talked about this in the past, though. I, I I'm, I'm, have always been sort of amazed that a, a beach town like Miami, uh, a hot town like Miami, like temperature-wise, um, has embraced stouts the way that, they, that, that, that the local consumer has. Well, it's not only stouts, too. I mean, it's anything, barley wines, Belgian triples, Belgian quads, anything I would say over 11% alcohol. I mean, people, I think, have two mindsets. It's either they want to come in and enjoy four or five beers and leave that way, or they want to come in and enjoy two beers and leave feeling the same way as the guy that drank four or five. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that's what we have seen. I mean, that's how it has played out from day one. But have you figured out, like, the disconnect between, I guess, the way that so many of us think of it, of warm weather not necessarily uh, going for these high alcohol beers versus, you know, I would think barley wines and some of those would go in the wilds of Minnesota or, right. you know, the Dakotas or, or wherever. You, not would, you wouldn't think that a big yeah. Imperial stout would work in Miami, but right. I thought I, if I you mean, guys did a Mexican lager, like that, right. that would be right. your cash cow. I mean, we have people walk in, you know, now in August and July when it is 95 degrees outside and hundred percent humidity asking, you know, where are the stouts? Why don't, the, why don't you have any stouts on? And you haven't figured out like why that is. It's just, that's what they want. That's what they want. Yeah. It's an interesting thing though, of paying attention to your consumer base and knowing what the consumer wants at any given moment and then giving it to them as well. I mean, we see it with new England IPA right. uh, where, you know, there's some breweries that that's all they make because that's all the fans want from them. Right. But your brewery is a little different in that, you have different people wanting different things from you all the time. And, and it's all niche. Like it's not necessarily like a, like a Sierra Nevada where, you know, everything people are going to trust it no matter what, but they're just right. going to go to pale um, all the time. It's, you have Florida vice bucket, you have stout bucket, you know, you have uh, the experimental bucket, like that kind of thing for, for consumers. Do they mix a lot or do you have like different lines, different camps, different, I mean, uh, People, I think, do kind of mix, but it's, there is definitely a separation because you definitely get the people that come in just to drink the sours or they only come in to drink the IPAs. And if they love stouts, that's all they're, they're going to drink. Yeah. They will drink other stuff, but that is what they're primarily there for. Yeah. As a brewer and a brewery owner, though, how hard is that to, to have those different buckets and have those different... Oh. Very hard. Okay. I mean, because you're not only brewing something for one category of people. You know, I mean, like, if all we did was make IPAs and did those well, then that'd be great. But we try to cover, you know, trying to throw darts at something, you know, all over the map. 
I mean, it's it's definitely tough to try to do everything well. Are we constantly working and tweaking things? Absolutely. You know, it's ne- we're never 100% satisfied with the way something turned out because we always think it could be better. Um, but it's definitely interesting to try to keep up with doing the hazies and then doing these sours and then the stouts and then having core beers which still move like crazy because you have to have That's those. Keep the lights oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know what I mean? Our, you know, our Hefeweizen is our number one seller and it outpaces everything four to one. Wow. Yeah. And you would think it, IPAs would still outsell it. And actually in Miami, blonde beers, mm-hmm. as they call them, yeah. uh, are the number one sellers. Hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, but it's definitely tough. Instead of just having one hat, we're wearing a lot of hats. Yeah. How do you reconcile that, though? Like, is it, do you have to change gears mentally or since it's all going to, to, you know, to the same business at the end of the day? I, I'm sure there's commonalities, but. It, it's tough because if you, we start to get on bins where we are knocking out four or five stouts in a row, then you're kind of leaving behind things that people have been asking for. Hey, well, all right, you got all these stouts. Well, what happened to the IPAs? Or, hey, what happened to the sours? Or if you have all these sours like we do right now with a mix of IPAs, hey, where are the stouts? So it's always like trying to play even keel, you know, but trying to still meet everybody's demands is, is a tough thing to ch- keep chasing. Yeah. One of the things that you do a lot of is collaborations. Yes. Uh, you, you're going around the country. People are coming to you. Um, We're doing one Saturday. Are you? Here in, in Denver? With Cerebral. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're recording this during JBF. It's going to okay. air uh, afterwards. But uh, uh, what are you making with Cerebral? Adjunct stout. <laughs> weird. Yes. Weird. Surprise. Weird. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, hey, I, I mean, I go to other half <laughs> and I go to Trillium Brewing and I brew stouts. <laughs> so, I mean, for two guys that make IPAs, you know, you know, I go up there and brew stouts with those guys. You know, it's it's fun, I think, for the, the consumer to, to have a lot of these because it's, it is – getting at least one of the two breweries that's involved uh, out of their comfort zone just a little bit. And I think that there's something that's fun that comes around with it. But from your brewing standpoint, what's in it for you? Camaraderie. Yeah. I mean, meeting new people, um, definitely seeing everybody's different approaches to brewing and different conceptualized ideas on recipes and how they approach those recipes. I mean, we go out of our comfort zone. I mean, basically, if we meet up with somebody and they're like, hey, you want to brew a beer? For me, it's like anything goes. I mean, what do you want to brew? I mean, if they tell me something off the wall, I go with it because it that doesn't bother me. I like to kind of be challenged with that. I mean, we brewed with uh, – we did a collaboration with Parrish Brewing out of Louisiana. Yeah. And we do it uh, – it'll be released here very shortly. Um, a sour IPA. With coconut and blueberry. Okay. That's what they wanted to do. So I was like. And they came to you with that and yep. said, this is what we want to do. And, yep. you know, um, and I guess you have that reputation now, right? Where it's like, whatever the brewers are coming up with something wacky. And it's like, yeah, let's call Wakefield. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we're not throwing chicken nuggets and French fries in, in the, in the beer, but you know, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, would, our, would our hamburgers. You? No, no. So it falls into it, that because that's yeah. a, that falls into that whole sort of purity thing as well yes, of yeah. just yeah. yeah. I do have a limit. Okay. I do have a limit. You know we've, you know I think I've been at uh, breweries and you know I think we were making like a, a birthday cake stout so one of them like ran to Publix or the same equivalency of you know grocery store and had a pre made cake and threw it in the mash you know what I mean. That to me is whatever but like hamburgers and French fries and chicken nuggets or you know, tacos or say, you know, sandwich, I, you know, to me, no, no. So if somebody came to you and said, Hey, let's do a hamburger and fry beer, but without throwing that in, would you find a workaround? Would you find ways of incorporating I mean, some a, of those flavors? I mean, a crap ton of sodium. Um, I mean, that would be tough to get that beef flavor to carry over. I don't know. I mean, I would definitely rule out any vegans from drinking the beer ever. So, you know, <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's uh, yeah. I, I mean, I still think there's a limit. I think it would anything have to be uh, n- non like protein wise. Yeah, yeah. 
Where you guys are in Miami, and I've talked to you in the past as uh, hurricanes have been barreling down you know, towards you, every time you hit hurricane season these days and every time you start to hear about uh, beach erosion and climate change and, and, and everything else, there's got to be a little bit of like a nervousness to it. But I, I, oh, I, I, was, I was nervous last year. And yeah. I wasn't even in the country, so which was worse. Right. And I couldn't get back. I was stranded for four additional days where I was, and it was like, okay, this is not great. I mean, we just had a massive hurricane roll through Miami and knock power out of the brewery for three days and then have no phone or internet for two weeks, so you can't even operate a tap room yeah, or pull any sails. So it was definitely very, very stressful. Every year is stressful, but living in Miami, I, I think you come to copes that it, it's going to happen sooner or later. It's kind of like living in California with earthquakes. Well, what are the what are some of the precautions that you guys take with the brewery? Well, I mean, overall, I mean, the structure itself is built out of concrete, yeah, and cinder blocks. So structurally, we're sound. Now, if it's strong enough, it's going to rip anything off the roof. Yes. So, what do we have in place when we lose power? We have generators. We have like a massive mobile generator to power the breweries to keep us in business. So whatever beer is in the tank does not go bad. Right. I mean, that's the number one concern that's, that's at that number point. One. Yeah. I mean, it's not brewing beer at that point because. That can wait, but if there's product in the tanks, we don't want to lose that product because yeah. it's almost finished. Right. So that's probably the most important thing. And then beyond that? Uh, I mean, obviously making sure everybody else that works for the brewery is in safe standing as well. And then uh, just, hope, I mean, structurally, we're not too worried. I mean, I remember uh, it's... I think a better word or like phrase would be like being able to get to the brewery <laughs> would be questionable because when Maria rolled through, it knocked down so many trees. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had a massive tree just hanging out on our road that I think my dad came through with a chainsaw and cut it all up just so people could get down the road. And then all of that debris from the cutting of the tree was on the side of the road for two months before the city ever came and picked it up. Wow. Yeah. These are things that I don't know if, if consumers are normally thinking about, of just the, you know, the environmental challenges no. that come. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's and every no matter where you are in the country, there's always going to be oh, you know, snow various storms, challenges, earthquakes, but, yeah. Yeah, hurricanes. Yeah. But certainly like where you guys are, I think, is a little bit more. What? Your problems are a little bit more acute. Yeah. We're on alert from May till November. Yeah. June, June, June till November. I mean, Having lived there over 30 years, I think the hurricane season has gotten longer and longer and longer. <laughs> you know what I mean? I remember. And the storms have been more intense. Yes. And I just remember as a kid being, okay, June, July, August was hurricane season. Yeah. And now we're, we go all the way till almost the end of the year, which is, which is crazy to me. And the, and the storms are actually worse in September and October mm-hmm. than in the summer months. Yeah. So. Knowing this and knowing, you know, longer forecasts and, and you can never predict. And Maria was, was one of those examples where, you know, like nobody really quite knew where it was going to hit. And then I guess the West Coast got hit more than, than the East Coast. Right. That was yeah. the. Well, uh, it rolled right up the middle of the state. Right. Um, how far in advance when you start seeing these things, do you start making adjustments at the brew house? That's a tough one, because also living in Miami, <laughs> we've gone through a lot of storms that everybody is freaked out about and then it never shows up. Yeah. Everybody goes and empties every single grocery store around and there's nothing left. And then the storm never comes. I mean, that's great for Publix. uh, Oh, absolutely. And and home Depot, (laughs) home Depot stock goes through the roof, you know? Um, but you know, if, if we think about it, I mean, Maria was this last one last year was the biggest one since what Wilma and Katrina, yeah. which was two thousand five, yeah. So twelve years, and it's not saying we haven't had hurricane warnings and everything in that time, which we have. It's just it's kind of like a roll of the dice. Yeah. Enough about weather. Um, I've had the good fortune of visiting your tap room and your brewery uh, several times, and and what I love about it uh, is the cross-section of beer culture and geek culture oh, of course yeah well, that's me okay well i mean <laughs> where do the two intersect uh, i mean i think I, I was a prime example i mean i've always been a, a geek you know as far as comic books star wars you know 
anything superhero wise and then also got into craft beer drinking yeah which i know a lot of people are draw the you know parallel to those as well mm-hmm. and for me it was just kind of bringing the best of both worlds into one space which is what the tap room brewery is for 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 me and i think a lot of people that work there as well share the same kind of views how important though is the melding of those two parts of your life i think very important i mean because it gets to i get to have both things at once you know what i mean i mean i get to brew the beer and then you know and and as far as the tap room goes i get to go to the comic book shop and buy things that you know i have no space out of my house so i put it in the brewery yeah so i mean the thing that i'm noticing more and more when breweries open up these days is that uh, so many of these things are uh, focus grouped out beforehand or uh, brewers are opening up and they're saying, well, you know, we want to represent this, but it's not necessarily them. It's they're thinking that that's what people might respond to. And that's what the people might want. Yeah. Yeah. But you're doing what you want and then finding the people who agree with you. And I, I wonder just from your experience, how much you think that authenticity has helped you got yeah, helped the brewery get to where it is today, a as opposed to just you know marketing something out. I mean, it, it's normally a comic book. I mean, a common question when people come in is like, "Oh, who's a Star Wars fan?" Yeah, like, are you really a Star Wars fan? And do then, you still then, have the Yoda mural on the wall? Is that uh, <laughs> yes? Okay. Yes, I do. That is still there. It's getting ready to be redone just because of high traffic issues and stuff like that. But yeah. we're getting ready to, to repaint it in the same format. But okay. You know, like I said, people come in and ask, like, who's a Star Wars fan? I mean, there's a lot of us in in the brewery itself, but, like, it's like, you know, I have a Darth Vader tattooed on my left forearm. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, it's... And you're wearing a Star Wars shirt right now. Exactly. And, yeah. and, my, and, and my... Everybody else, like, and, with you has some sort of Star Wars paraphernalia on them and, as well. And my luggage is Darth Vader and Stormtrooper. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really... That's, that's who I am. I mean, I think authenticity of being who you are counts more than you know what you think everybody else might like yeah because then you're not really being yourself you know you're trying to be what everybody else wants you to be and we're just we're brewing beer that we want to brew that we like to brew and it just happens that everybody enjoys it yeah as we start to wrap up i've been asking folks um what's your hope for beer hmm that's that's a big question. Um, I've definitely seen, you know, I I got in when I opened the brewery. We were still on a massive climb. Mm-hmm. I mean, the whole craft beer community itself was on a massive, massive upswing. I mean, I it was hard to see that in any kind of any kind of business. I mean, just you know, I remember knowing Cigar City and working there and the kind of growth rates those guys were going and ending up in like the Forbes 500 as far as growth rates go for a company at three or 400% till now where it started to flatline. Yeah. I think it's getting harder for guys to get in, but there is how many breweries now? 6,000. Yeah. It's uh, 6,700. Yeah. Almost 7,000 breweries in the whole United States. And yeah. there are still people trying to open breweries. I think it's going to be harder for those guys. Um, I'm not saying we don't embrace those guys, but it's definitely going to be a harder playing field with less real estate. I mean, because there's not an upswing in bars. You know what I mean? There's yeah. not there's not a 200% growth in craft beer bars around the country. So everybody's fighting for real estate on these tap lines. I mean, I would still like to see... I mean, I said this four or five years ago that I knew within probably this time span that we would see kind of that climax and that curtail and flat line. I don't think there'll be the, the eighties bust. No, but I do think there will be a flat line and I think we will have, you know, I've talked to other guys around the country and guys are like, yeah, people are closing as fast as guys are opening now. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I hope people, I, I don't see, I see more people starting to drink crap beer. Yeah. I mean, more people are getting educated. I mean, I think it's the same thing with food. I mean, you know, you see more people getting into food and being foodies and finding better food. I think that that that's the way it's going to go. I mean, I everybody that op- has opened, I think people are going to start gravitating towards the people that make the best quality product. 
I mean, I think that's the way it's going to go. And unfortunately, I mean, that's the way things usually go anyway. Um, I would like to see people, you know, still strive to make the best quality beer, not just jump in this thing to try to make money. Yeah. Because that's what I definitely saw when I started. I, I got into it because I love it. I mean, I was a CPA for 15 years. I didn't love that. I love this. Um, but I know plenty of people that jumped in just to try to make money and not because they care about crap beer or the people that are drinking it. They just want to make something, whether it's good, bad, mediocre, whatever, they just want to try to make a profit off of it. Yeah. I mean, I would like to see that kind of go away and more of a focus on making great quality product for the consumer. I mean, I wish that's the way we would go because there's still a lot of bad beer out there. That's a really interesting point, and it's a conversation that I've been having more and more these days because we, we've gotten into – you know, what is craft beer? What is independent beer? What is, you know, there's all these different qualifiers that, well, that come on these things. Right. But we're not discussing quality in that. We're just sort of discussing right. either, you know, ownership or, you know, not a big guy. Well, I mean, independency, I mean, I can give you a prime example. That would be us. In, in the Wynwood area, there will now be five breweries okay. within five block radius. Which is pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, maybe even smaller area, maybe like four block radius. Um, of the five, there's only one independent. Okay. And that's, and that's us. You. you have Vesa Sur, which is ABI. Okay. You have Heineken Lagunitas, which is coming in being built. Okay. Uh, you have Concrete Beach, which is Sam Adams. Right. Um, well, yeah. doesn't Sam Adams fall into the Brewers Association definition? It does. It does. I mean, as craft. Yeah. Um, but then would you qualify Concrete Beach as independent if they're owned by Sam Adams? Interesting. Uh, and then you also have Wynwood, which is owned and partial by CBA, which is then owned and partial by ABI. So of those... That's right. I forgot, I forgot about that sale a couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah. So of those, we are the only independently owned craft brewery. Does that matter? Nowadays... No, okay. because I to the consumer, no, because you know we you know everybody knows that we're a mom and pop, mm -hmm. um, per se, and just as many people go hang out at Vesa Sur or Concrete Beach and know no better, and they don't really care. Mm -hmm. It's just craft beer, right? At that point, I mean. Does it really? Or it's just not industrial light lager. Right, right, yeah. right. You know, I mean, to me, does it matter? Yeah. You know, because I, I didn't start the thing with millions of dollars, and nor do I have millions to back it up. You know what I mean? Um, it's definitely, I, it's a very important to me, but not. But that is also why I think they made the move to putting the independent craft beer logo on this thing. The upside you down know? bottle. Right, yeah. the upside down bottle. You know, which National I think Ketchup is, Association is what I've been calling it, but yeah, it's uh, we, get the fifty seven yes. goes out faster. Exactly. You know what I mean? But I mean, to me, that's important. Yeah, it is. I mean, now can I get very picky and say, do I see sales? I mean, I can get very picky. Like, yeah, sales to Constellation or ABI. I think those were done to undermine and really cutthroat on craft beer. Yeah. Oh yeah. And now sales like the craftman or a uh, fireman capital, mm -hmm. that's more like a conglomerate of craft breweries. Right. I don't think they're trying to cut throat. I think they're looking at an overall picture of increasing volume, maybe dropping prices, but not coming in and cutting bottom dollar and trying to cut the little guys out. Sure. And fireman capital has cigar city down by exactly. you and they have uh uh, Oscar Blues and now, do yeah. I believe in other craft breweries working together like that? Absolutely. If if those guys like you know, if those guys want to come in and buy in a different brewery, then that's fine by me. But the guys like ABI and Constellation and Heineken and those, no, I don't. I don't believe in that. I mean, I think they're really undermining the whole deal. So you're fighting this now, like, basically on the street level. If yeah. you have these five other breweries that are around you these days, I mean, because. You, from where I sit, sometimes it's it's the view from thirty seven thousand feet. Unless I'm, you know, in your neighborhood, to, to the local local person just walking around, looking for a place to drink beer, they're not going to know a difference. Hmm. I mean, they'll tell a difference once they step foot inside of it. 
you know, and just by the difference of the beers that are being made there, you'll have a massive difference once you step inside. From the outside, it's all the same to them. Um, but we are the only, the only one of those five that operate the way that we do with the stouts, with the sours, with the hazy IPAs. I mean, we are like true craft. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're making, we're not making a light lager and chilling it to 26 degrees and serving it that way. <laughs> you could though, if you wanted to. Well, of course, if we wanted to do that, but that's not who we are. And, and I don't want to start reaching for that because that's not who I am. No. Yeah. John Wakefield, thanks so much for sitting down. This no was, problem. This was a lot of fun. Uh, if people want to go visit you in Miami, they should absolutely go visit you in Miami and you're on all the various websites and Instagrams. And Hopefully they'll come visit us while we're here at GBF too. Well, yeah, but this is, this is going to air. Like, <laughs> I know, I know, you know, I know. Weeks and weeks afterwards. So and now I'm going to have to edit that out. So thanks. Uh, are you going to, are you going to be on the floor? What's that? Yeah, I'm going to be walking around tonight. Right. I got the bow tie. I'm, I'm ready to, I'm ready to party. Okay. Um, Thanks again for doing this. All right, brother. Uh, if folks want to reach out to me directly, if you have a guest you'd like to hear on the show, uh, topics you'd like addressed, or questions you'd like answered, you can reach me at John Hall, J-O-H-N-H-O-L-L, at beerandbrewing.com. You can also go to beerandbrewing.com where you can subscribe to the magazine. You can learn all about home brewing, ingredients, uh, and brewers like John. Um, thanks so much again. Thank you. And we'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Cheers. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.